Hey there, thanks for tuning in to Duck Bricks. I'm Chris and welcome to a brand new episode of Brick Breakdown, the show where we take a look at some of the cancelled set artwork, prototypes, minifigure designs, and everything and anything that went into the creation of a new LEGO theme. Today's topic is LEGO Legends of Chima, the quote-unquote Big Bang theme that launched in 2013 to moderate success, successful enough that it lasted all three planned years. So because there's just so much conceptual artwork, designs, and set prototypes that went into creating Chima and that are actually publicly available out there, I decided to split up this series into a few different videos. Last time, if you didn't check that out already, we took a look at some of the early conceptual artwork that went into creating the look and feel of the entire theme. What kinds of things were the designers and artists considering and how did that evolve into what we got today? But now this time we'll be taking a look at one very specific aspect of the development process, specifically the minifigure designs and how Chima finally landed upon its final minifigure designs for the entire theme. There is a lot to unpack here because LEGO designers went through a ton of different designs for all sorts of tribes and even a ton of stuff that never even saw the light of day. So without further ado, let's just jump right into things. I hope you enjoy this video and let's get started. When Chima first arrived on the scene in 2013, one of the most interesting aspects of the theme were the minifigures, and people were shocked at just how detailed every single minifigure was. Now, we might take these for granted today, but back then in 2013, these minifigures were revolutionary, sporting some of the most advanced detail we had ever seen on any LEGO minifigure to date, almost every single character featured a brand new molded armor piece, a brand new mold for their head, and all sorts of metallic and intricate detail all around their faces, torso, and legs. These absolutely were a step up for LEGO, and obviously a lot of design work went into creating the look and feel for the figures, especially where it came to determining how exactly to handle the animal heads, whether to make them standard minifigure heads with hair pieces, or to do something a little bit in between, or to do full-on animal molds for heads. Dozens and dozens of alternatives were considered, and we'll be taking a look at all of those and more today. Now, of course, Chima launched with just a few specific tribes and slowly the numbers grew, but it's really interesting because from the beginning, there were a lot of different tribes conceptualized, and it took a lot of effort for them to nail down which tribes to actually focus on for the very first launch year. And so, of course, in part one, we kind of took a look at the general concepts for the theme itself, which did showcase some of the minifigure designs, but this video is dedicated just to the minifigures themselves, and the plethora of unique and interesting designs that sprung forth from the many pieces of concept artwork which have been published to date for Legends of Chima. And so, the general structure of this video will be starting off with some of the general animal designs, some of the early concepts where they were trying to figure out how to narrow down the tribes to just a few main focuses, and then we're going to take a look at certain tribes one by one, starting off with the heroes like the lions, eagles, and gorillas, going to the villains for the first year, the crocodiles, wolves, and ravens, and then everything and anything in between. These are the Legends of Chima, so let's go. I think this piece of concept artwork is probably the perfect place to start off. So originally, as we discussed in the previous video, Legends of Chima was conceptualized as a theme focused around humans. Yes, humans, or regular people, who put on animal headdresses and gained the powers of the animals. Which is why, as you can see in this first concept image, a lot of the faces, while still animal stylized, obviously are people wearing headdresses. And this is especially clear in the eagle and the crocodile, where you can see extra sets of eyes underneath there. And the snake warrior has that as well. It's really interesting because they really kind of were shifting back and forth between whether or not they wanted to make them actual anthropomorphic animals or just humans wearing the headdresses. I think it was a great idea that they did eventually settle on them being animal-like creatures themselves just to set it apart from other LEGO themes, but it is kind of interesting seeing what could have been. But besides this, you can already see some early exploration of what would be the main tribes to be featured in the entire storyline of Chima. Obviously here you have your lions and your eagles and even your gorillas as some of the main forces. Interestingly enough, that gorilla isn't necessarily looking like a heroic character, they probably were trying to figure out whether they wanted the gorillas to be heroes or villains, but then you have some clearly villain styled characters like the scorpion there which eventually would arise in the Dark Tribes Outlands theme for year 2. We also have a snake warrior which presumably was cancelled very quickly because of, well, Ninjago, and third is the crocodile warrior there, which of course became one of the main villains for the entire Chima sub-theme for at least the first year. 
Also interestingly featured here is a bear warrior, where of course we did see bears in Chima, but we never actually got a physical bear until year 3, which was really interesting how they really held off on giving us bears, and I'm not quite sure what that first animal is supposed to be. It could be just another form of lion, although he has really long ears, so... Maybe it's like a mouse or a rat-like creature, but it is orange-colored. Not really sure exactly what that's supposed to be, maybe like a jaguar or some other type of cat, but interesting seeing the early concept explorations for the initial animal tribes of Chima. One of the more interesting things that we discussed in the previous video was the color scheme for the scorpions being primarily black and red. Obviously, when we eventually got them in the show, this was not their color scheme, but the black and red scorpions really harken back to another older LEGO theme, Knight's Kingdom 2, where the evil knight Vladek used an army of scorpion knights in this exact color scheme, the black and dark red. So it's kind of funny seeing how reminiscent this is to some of the older LEGO concept designs. Of course, for the rest of the animals, you can see that there were a lot of changes made to the overall aesthetic, and we're going to be taking a look at this exact aesthetic for the animals just for a little while longer as we continue to go on throughout this review. So of course, moving onwards, they did actually experiment with a lot more tribes than just these ones. Right here is a black and white image of a few more tribes such as swamp creatures, which is really interesting because these swamp creatures don't really pertain to a specific animal. We have cheetahs, which maybe were too close to the actual DC character of cheetah. We have bulls or rams there being a heroic force, which actually cropped up quite a lot in the older conceptual drawings from the first video. Another kind of scorpion or lobster-like character, a vulture who we would get until the zombified ice tribes of year 3, a bat, again, got that in year 2, and another design for the lion himself, which seems to be again using the minifigure wearing a headdress type idea. I find it interesting here how the vulture in particular proposed a brand new mold which would have combined the wings and the head. I would have really loved to see that just because of how distinctive the neck of the vulture is there. Although, to be honest, I do understand why they eventually just gave us the standard kind of headpiece for the vultures just to make it fit in a little bit better with the rest of the tribes. Moving onwards to this next image here, we have more animalistic designs which are a lot closer to what we would eventually get for the final animals of Chima. They still were leaning into brand new specialized molds for the main headpieces of the characters, and what's very interesting is that we have an axle-like design from Nexo Knights being used for a bear there, maybe a polar bear, because you can see the mountain cap emblem on the torso itself, and he's literally using the large hand pieces which eventually Axel would get for Nexo Knights. So very fascinating seeing that design already being conceptualized this early on in Shima's development. Of course, we have some more eagles with a much larger headdress right there, as well as a tiger or panther-like character, and the gorillas seem to have been traded out for just a standard monkey-like character, which we can see on the bottom left of the screen. Now, the lion there is a lot more reminiscent of the lions that we would eventually get for Chima with a very specialized headpiece, although what is quite interesting about some of these characters is that they all feature these specialized hand elements, or claws, which were actual pieces that could have been added on to the character's hands themselves, which we saw again in that initial video, which unfortunately they did not decide to do because probably that would have guaranteed another set of brand new molds having to be made for every single new animal. So, cost-wise, I can see why that probably wouldn't have made too much sense. But with that, we can move on to some of the more interesting color drawings of some of the animals of Legends of Chima, where most of these black and white drawings were actually colored in for the first time. So pretty much here we have the same animals that we just saw but just colored in differently and one more animal, the wolf right there who actually features a brand new headpiece and wolf claws. And interestingly enough, that particular wolf headpiece which has the cowl kind of going over the mouth of the character was supposed to be the headpiece for the wolves for the longest time in development before they eventually changed it to a more fully covered expression. I really like here how the lion, or I guess that's supposed to be Laval, has the actual leopard style of print on his cape. It's a really cool printing that I kind of wish they actually did for the final sets. Unfortunately, while Chima characters did have a lot of capes, none of them throughout the entire set run were printed. And while it probably wasn't necessary, I just think it would have been that much cooler to actually have a print on the cape there. 
Now that being said, you can see a lot of different characters here finally taking shape. The bull-like Minotaur character there is a really interesting one because I'm not even sure if that's supposed to be a hero or villain. You can see him on both sides in the initial concept drawing, so not really clear on what they were thinking there. Potentially they were trying to pass it back and forth. And what's also interesting is that she seemed to have been colored differently. They still had the concept of the animals cheeing up because they needed to have the construction characters be an aspect of the theme, but here you can see some of them use yellow chi, red chi, orange chi, and it seems to really just fluctuate based on the animal wear instead of just having the good guys use blue and the bad guys use red, which to me always felt a little bit oversimplified in terms of just clearly stating who was good and who was bad, but I guess it makes sense for kids to actually be able to understand which ones were the actual heroes or villains. Of course, onto the next drawing here, you can see some more colored sketches from the black and white initial concept phases that we took a look at just previously. The swamp creature has a really cool color scheme, really looks like he came out of monster fighters or something like that, so probably that's why they didn't actually include him as an actual character. But it's really interesting seeing how a lot of these themes were developing around the same time, such as Ninjago, Monster Fighters, Chima, and all of them were trying to incorporate their own style of animal designs. Eventually, Ninjago got snakes, Monster Fighters got the Swamp Monster, and Chima got, well, everything else. I also like how they have a gecko design here, while they probably thought it was a little bit too close to the crocodiles themselves to include it, it's interesting seeing how they were initially planning on maybe having a whole line of swamp animals be the villains. From crocs to geckos to lizards to swamp creatures, these all on the bottom row here look like they were all supposed to be part of a faction of swamp animals. And on the top there we have all the flying animals, from bats to eagles to vultures. I kind of wish we saw vultures in the non-zombified form after seeing this artwork here. Just look at how cool the headpiece looks on that, which of course probably wasn't super feasible for them to do eventually as the line went on, but that would have been a really interesting design, and I like how again you can see that each and every one of the characters has a very unique handpiece, which they presumably were planning on actually custom molding per animal character. Of course, some of them could have been reused, like the eagle and vultures sharing the same mold for the hands, but I really think that would have added a lot of really extra added depth to the characters themselves, but ultimately probably wasn't needed. Of course, again, we did get the bats for year two, and it's interesting how the color scheme stayed fairly similar. It still has the purplish or kind of light bluish sheen to it, so I can see how that pretty much stayed the same almost throughout the entirety of development. Moving on from that though, we have yet more concepts where this one in particular is an interesting development on whether or not they were trying to figure out to actually have them being minifigure heads underneath and make the primary faces just standard minifig heads, or to transform them into a more animalistic look and feel. You can see the bottom designs there for the spider, croc, and swamp creature actually have standard animal molds being placed on top of the heads themselves, which is kind of pushing it into the other extreme. Funnily enough, the actual final products that we got for Chima are kind of a cross between these two extremes. Instead of just having standard minifigure heads, but they also don't have these full-on animal molds, they're a mix where you can see the animal heads over the actual standard minifig head, but you can still see the eyes peeking through, which I think was generally a good idea. It does come with some compromises, which they actually do explicitly note later on in this video. We'll take a look at some concepts where they say that, oh, it's too bad you can't actually see the mouth move, but I think it kind of makes sense for the direction they were going. You can see the even closer exploration for what would eventually be probably the closest to what we would see for the final designs right here in the lions, eagles, and gorillas, which ultimately were decided on as the main heroes for the wave. You can see right there that they were trying to really push the different facial expressions for the teeth and mouth expressions of the minifigure faces themselves, really showing off underneath the headdresses themselves, but I guess they ultimately decided that it looked a little bit too odd to have a very large protruding say for the lion a snout and teeth up there and then just the standard flat mouth animated for the TV show that would have looked a little bit odd so I can understand why they did not do that but it is still kind of a shame that we now no longer actually get to see different mouth expressions for the characters of Chima which was a particular sore point for Gorzan the gorilla who for the first few releases of Chima only had a very angry face which did not make any sense in context with the show. Kind of like what we have with Zane and Ninjago today. 
but I digress. Moving onwards, we have some more explorations of the headgears, where you can see the middle headgears are kind of very similar to what we would eventually get. The Croc and Raven is basically the same as what we actually eventually got for the final sets, and same for the Eagle, but of course the Lion, Gorilla, and Wolf had been changed significantly. This seemed to be the type of phase where they were still really trying to push the minifigure's expression for the mouth underneath to really drive home the alternate expressions for the characters here. Of course, the Gorilla one would have just shown the actual face, which to to be completely honest, I feel like I kind of would have preferred so the gorillas could actually have different facial expressions. That being said, I can understand if that didn't fit stylistically with the rest of the animals, so I can see why they decided to actually fill out the entire mold for the rest of them. But now it's probably time to actually delve a little bit closer into the final tribes themselves, and the evolution of the tribes that we eventually got. And so, for the next few images, we're going to be focusing exclusively on the lion tribe. Here we can see three different versions of the lions being developed. Presumably these were all going to be the same character, just in different styles. We have the first initial draft of the lion, which we saw earlier in the video, holding a sword that seems very Nexo Knights inspired now that I look at it, but you have the standard minifigure head and just a very wild and wacky hairpiece to kind of introduce the lion aesthetic. Then on the left there you have a minifigure wearing a much more intricate molded lion headdress. This seems to be a remnant from the concept where standard humans or regular minifigures wear the lion headdresses. And finally, down at the bottom, we have a fully molded lion head, which I guess is closest to what we eventually got, but it still isn't quite the same. And eventually, they would have ultimately decided on something that was a cross between all of these, trying to get essentially the best of both worlds. Here's a concept of the speedors, and why I kind of wanted to put this here is you can really see the initial concepts for both the croc and the lion getting closer and closer to having the fully molded animal heads. It's kind of cool seeing what could have been with the early designs for the speedors here. But then of course we have the fully colored concept artwork for the first image that we saw initially for the lions, which featured the other characters in black and white. This now features all of the characters fully in color, where you can see the sorts of details that they were trying to induce for each of the characters themselves. Once again, you have the more standard minifigure style of design with just a lion aesthetic wearing the headdress first, then the standard one with a minifig head and crazy hairpiece in the middle, and then on the far side we have the fully molded lion head, which looks really interesting but doesn't really offer too much in terms of being able to change the expression. And then from there, they were trying to incorporate different styles of legend beasts or full-size lions, which is very interesting to me, seeing how it evolved from a more robotic concept to one that's a lot more organic, which we can kind of see throughout the rest of the concepts here. So this first one showcases a robotic lion being ridden into battle, which eventually I guess would stand up and act as a companion. This has been kind of rendered in brick-built form, or somewhat close to brick-built form here, showcasing the joints of the lion itself, which I kind of like how they were leaning into the teal color for the robotics. That is a really cool choice for the color scheme that I kind of wish they actually did do for the final sets, but alas, that was not meant to be. And then moving on, it seems that this is a little bit further in the development process, where they decided to move away from just the standard minifig face, and go closer to the actual animal headpiece on the front, and then the standard minifig teeth below. Here we have a chief, a shaman, a soldier, a rookie, a berserker, and of course our hero who would eventually become Laval, and it's interesting seeing the different character archetypes being used here, especially because they really try to emphasize different types of head molds for the lions themselves, like the shaman having long hair swept back in a beard, and the berserker having crazy styled hair and even a chain on his chest there. These are all really fun designs and concepts which ultimately would have to be pared down because it probably just didn't make fun financial sense to make a brand new head mold for each of the character types. Still, I kind of wish that we actually got the Lion Shaman or even the Shaman or Wizard-like characters for Chima. I always thought those designs were really interesting when we saw them in the concept art video that we published earlier. Now moving onwards, we now go into a design that is a lot closer to the legend beasts themselves. Instead of having the full-size lions being robotic, they decided to make them standard lions, just kind of larger than life-sized, and instead you have another shaman character there, some more different styles of lions and the kind of power that would evoke from using the headdresses, and the actual animals themselves. 
This concept seems to directly relate to the initial concept which was focusing on, again, humans, or maybe not humans, or not quite humans, but some sort of species or tribalistic culture using intricate animal-shaped headdresses to channel the powers of the animals. Presumably, that's where the standard animals came in. Maybe they were channeling these animals themselves when they used the powers, because you can see there, the lion shaman is actually using an eagle headdress. That is an eagle bill on there, which is really emphasizing the swappability between different animals using the powers of other animals, which is an interesting concept but probably would have been a little bit visually confusing. I just really wish we actually got these rideable molded Lego animals in Shima. It took them literally years to finally give us a realistic system styled minifigure scaled lion, and man, I just wish we actually got them for Chima. While the buildable legend beasts were really cool and a great use of the Mixel system, I just wish that we got these in larger sets instead because these look really good. Moving onwards, they started to explore different types of characters for the lions themselves. Starting off with this first one, we have returned to the standard minifigure face and crazy hairpiece, which of course was one of the first early designs here, and they really were trying to come up with different facial expressions for the characters, and then we have pretty much the same exact character, except in a different style, where they were trying to figure out the different spray painted colors, and the nose color as well for the more molded headdress, which again was kind of the intermediate form. Notice how the facial expression basically stayed the same from what we eventually got, which is really interesting because the style for the face is very, very similar to the final product. And then they experimented with different characters. Here is what obviously would become Legravis, and I can already see some of the shortcomings of this particular design. It feels just a little bit flat and two-dimensional for being a lion to me, and having the details really scrunched up there with the beard and the nose on a standard minifigure face just feels a little bit uncanny and odd. So I can understand why they did not go for that. Of course, here is where we finally get to the standard lion headpiece, which is ultimately what they decided on going for for the final designs. As you can see, they were trying to kind of come up with the names of the characters. Most of them are the same, except Lobar's name eventually changed to Leonidas, which is kind of interesting. And the foot soldiers themselves did gain names, like Lennox, for example. So interesting how they were kind of trying to experiment with the different characters here. And finally, we have the initial concept designs for the TV show itself with Laval, Lagravas, Leonidas, Longtooth, Lennox, and other lion warriors alongside the lion elders, which sadly, we never got as actual minifigures, although as you can see, they actually specifically came up with under the headpiece facial expressions for the lion elders themselves, presumably if LEGO ever decided to make them as physical figures. That again would have required a brand new mold, so I can understand why they didn't do it, but it's a shame because those are really cool designs. But I think now this image is a good one to leave us at, which actually showcases one of the early lion designs with a crocodile, as we shift our focus to some of the other tribes, like the eagles. And this is our first initial concept sketch for the eagles, showcasing three very different designs, similarly to how we had the lions in that initial drawing. So obviously the one that is closest to what we got is the one on the far left, and by now it's probably pretty obvious that the LEGO designers were presented with these three options, and ultimately decided to iterate upon the one on the left, which is basically a headdress piece that fully covers the eyes and does leave the mouth exposed, to continue to develop it for the final theme, which eventually ended up in not even the mouth being exposed at all. Again, would have been really cool to get an alternate mold for each of the animals for the full head, but I do think what they decided on is a little bit more keeping within the LEGO style and also allows for better expressions rather than a solid chunky mold. I do think my least favorite out of the bunch is the middle one because it really just looks like a human in an eagle costume. It could work for certain other themes, but just doesn't really work for what Chima would eventually become. So I do appreciate the aesthetic they eventually decided on. And the color scheme of the white and light blue is really nice, obviously this is what they did end up working on for the eagles themselves, but I think it's a really solid concept for this particular design as well. Now moving onwards here, this is probably one of the most interesting concepts to me, because here we can actually see a very clear overview of all of the different concepts, in fact 8 in total, that they were trying to figure out for the character design. Number 1 is the upper mask and print, 2 is the full mask, 3 is just a beak element in a face print, 4 is the face by itself, 5 is a mask and the print for eyes, 6 is a very strange looking wig plus a beak, 7 is the wig and a face print, and 8 is the headgear and print for the standard human design. 
So out of all of these, again, we probably got something closer to 2 slash 5, but then again, not all of these are super close to what we eventually ended up getting. Getting an actual beak piece to go around the neck of characters would have been really interesting, but obviously not something that worked out for Chima, and I'm just really happy they did not end up with number 6 because something looks really off with that design. Moving onwards, we have the more eagle style of legend beast type of thing, similar to how we saw the lion. Be prepared to see many illustrations in this exact layout with a large beast in the middle and some of the more humanoid characters on the sides with warriors on the left side and a shaman or wizard-like character on the right. This is again kind of a mix between the standard humans wearing headdresses plus the actual characters who are fully eagle-like anthropomorphic animals here, and it's cool actually seeing the full-on eagle legend beast as kind of a Lord of the Rings like eagle mold plus the smaller form of eagle which i still think would have been a really cool piece to get obviously we have a life-size eagle for lego city now which we got around 2016 but that is a pretty interesting design that is a completely different shape now what's really interesting is that we actually have some images of prototype minifigures thanks to a set commercial that was supposed to be an internal presentation of what Chima was but eventually got leaked. So these are actually the full on prototypes for eagles as you can see they actually had what looked to be molded wings sticking out of the back of the armor. I am very happy with the final wings that we got because those are just really useful in a variety of different applications but it's really interesting seeing how this is probably the closest they were getting to actual molded heads. They were trying to give the very cartoonish facial expressions and the bills are very large which you can see there which I think honestly this is probably not quite as good as we eventually got but it is still fascinating to see so much different molded detail being introduced in the armor pieces the weapons and the head pieces all of which do not exist at all. Moving on from that, we got our final concepts for the actual characters themselves, and here we are getting closer and closer to the actual final designs. Here you can notice that Ellis was changed to Eris, which I guess makes a little bit of sense because Ellis is a little bit more of a masculine sounding name, but we've got all sorts of other ones like Ewald, the leader of the ruling council, one of the elders, Eagle Special Forces, and pilots and whatnot, all of which we eventually got as named minifigures, which is pretty cool to see the initial development being so close to what we finally got for these sets themselves. And here we have the final layout for the TV show which was presented as the character designs. We have Eris, Eglor, some eagle warriors, Equila, Egbert who was another kind of scientist like eagle which unfortunately we never got as a minifigure but it's interesting seeing how they did develop a face for him. And then we have different members of the ruling council, Elon there, as well as Ewald who is a minifigure that we eventually got. Moving on from that though, I think it's time we turn our attention to the final main hero faction for the first year, who are the Gorillas. So the Gorillas do not have quite as much different concept designs as some of the other characters, but they still have a fairly decent amount. Here you can see the actual Gorillas being used with their Legend Beast here, again exactly the same layout as the other image, where we have first a standard warrior on the top, we have a second one who is channeling the elemental, or not quite elemental, the animal power of the Gorillas themselves, and then we have a shaman or wizard-like gorilla character who is wielding a really interesting Aztec or Incan inspired staff. I really wish we actually got that as an actual Lego piece. And of course, we have the small animal and the large animal. Much like we saw with the lions and eagles, here we have a fully molded gorilla as the large animal and then the standard Lego monkey being used as a small one because hey, if it works, why change it? Which eventually they did change for City, but at the time the standard classic monkey was still in use. Now, it's really interesting seeing that again they really were trying to hone in on what they wanted the legend beast to look like, going so far as to come up with what could be molds for the different beasts, which unfortunately we never got. So we never actually got this style of gorilla as a real Lego piece. Moving on from that, this is kind of a generic animal headdresses thing, but the emphasis is on the gorillas, so I wanted to focus in on these ones. You can see a little bit of the bats, wolves, and lions up top, which we'll be taking a look at a little bit later, but at the bottom there are a lot of different gorilla illustrations, from the one just showing the entire minifigure face all the way through, to all sorts of different gorilla headpieces. The middle one is closest to what we eventually got, but again, that mouth eventually got covered, much like many of the other designs. 
And thanks to the leaked commercial, we now have images of the actual Gorilla minifigures used as prototypes with very odd looking molded heads. Yeah, to be honest, these are a little bit uncanny to me and I'm much happier with what we finally got. Although it is cool seeing them literally used as other Lego minifig parts like the Pirates of the Caribbean pieces being used as the torso and legs for the gorillas there because honestly, it seems like they were just trying to develop the heads themselves. So that's all that matters. Finally, moving inwards, we have two different designs, one for the headpiece just being fully exposed, again showcasing the face underneath, which is a nice design but does look a little bit flat when viewed from the side, and then we have what is probably the closest to what we eventually got, which is the molded head right here, showing just the eyes and the mouth expression cannot change. So same character, just two different styles of doing it. And then that brings us to the final different iterations of the actual gorillas themselves. You can notice some of the names changed. Gordo or Grizo changed to Gorzan. And we have some gorilla warriors, uh, Old and Wise and Galana, which is actually pretty close to what we eventually got in the final design. But with that, I think we have summed up the hero factions for the first year. And it's now time to take a look at the villains. So for the villains, we start off with, of course, the crocodiles. So Krager and Kruller were already going to be some of the main characters here, and wow, you can see just the amount of variability that went into designing the characters themselves, from actually having just the crocodile jaw being like an underbite, to an actual animal headdress being worn by the characters themselves, to Kruller actually just having a massive crocodile head on top of her, which looks a little bit uncanny, I'm not gonna lie. These were all sorts of different designs that they were planning for the different crocodile faction. One thing that is pretty constant among these is that they initially were supposed to have tails, which is a detail retained by the TV show itself, but sadly, something we never got for the minifigs themselves. And a tail piece did actually exist thanks to the LEGO collectible minifigure series Godzilla-like animal suit, we just never actually got it for the minifigs of Chima. Now here is kind of funny because we have the full size legend beast next to the quote unquote smaller size crocodile, which is just the standard crocodile animal mold. So again, they were really trying to come up with a mold that would fit for standard Lego city or minifigure type designs, which we kind of saw back in the eagle. There was a more realistic scaled eagle to minifigures and the same for the lion. We saw a realistic scaled lion and then they have this more fantasy inspired rideable large animal like the crocodile legend beast, which again, unfortunately, Unfortunately, we never got. Alongside them, yet again, we have the standard warrior, then we have one channeling the animal power out of their hands, and then we have the croc shaman who again is part of that whole Incan or Aztec type vibe that they were going with for the more mystical side of things for Chima, which unfortunately we never got for the final products. And again, if you do want to take a closer look at those, there was an entire concept developed for this Aztec or Incan or Mayan inspired design, which we took a look at in the earlier video. So here we return to that older image that we looked at with the lions, except this time focusing in on the crocodiles. Take a look at that specialized hand piece, which would have been really interesting to get, although I understand why eventually we didn't get it. And this is also very interesting because it seems that the crocodile's eyes are the actual eyes of the character, but it's just the mouth underneath which is showing. Kind of an odd setup, and I understand why they just decided to close the mouths up for the final thing. And here we have the final designs for the crocodiles themselves. So this is pretty much almost exactly what we got. We never actually got the insane croc or some of the foot soldiers as actual sets. Would have really liked to see that plain green one. That's a really nice design that we never got. But of course, everything else is basically the same here. And you can see the early conceptual design for the fully molded crocodile head being introduced in this image here. Albeit with a very different internal face for the minifig itself. But here is something very interesting, because these are the crocodiles with fully molded heads, again from that prototype commercial, which showcases what LEGO was trying to experiment with given the specialized molded heads and not having any sort of minifig heads underneath. You can actually see these crop up quite a few times in our next video where we take a look at the set prototypes, because there were quite a few different crocodile sets conceptualized using this exact headpiece, so really interesting to see that, but also I am happy with what we got because this just feels a little bit strange and awkward to me and of course they can't really turn their heads this way. This is a lot closer to the Ninjago snakes and serpentine that we eventually got so it makes sense given that the themes are being developed at similar times. 
Moving on from there, we now have the wolves. So here we have yet another concept design for different iterations of the wolves themselves. This one is really only using seven different wolf concepts from the standard upper mask to the full on mask to the wig and face print to the wig and nose and face print which is looking especially cursed to me, the mask and print for the eyes and the headgear and print. Obviously they went with a mix between numbers one and two, which I think definitely makes a lot of sense, but again, interesting seeing how they basically took the same exact template, it's this kind of three-dimensional standard blank minifigure being drawn onto the page, and then just reused it for all the different animals as they tried to decide on the different designs that all fit the same aesthetic. So they were really going into a lot of development effort to do this. Now moving inwards, we have the different designs for the wolves themselves. Remember this was before Lego Hobbit actually introduced the warg mold, so they were really on their own when trying to come up with a more realistic Lego minifigure styled wolf animal, as well as a more stylistic legend beast mutated or large version of it. But again, we've got the wolf warrior, wolf channeling the actual powers of the animals, and then the shaman with a beard right there with a very nice staff as well. Moving on from that, we actually have some of the early designs for the wolf minifigures. I really do wish they actually had this more furry style of cape, which we never actually got for the minifigs themselves. I believe Wars had one that was a lot larger than this, but in the show it looked a lot like this, so this would have been a cool cut of cloth to get. And the armor piece is really interesting because obviously they had not decided on the armor yet, so between this concept and the next one, they were really just trying to figure out what style of armor are they going to give these characters, right down to even experimenting with one without armor entirely. So all of these are really cool and interesting designs that ultimately lended themselves to the final product, which we can see right here, for the different wolves, where many of these we did not get as many figs, like the one with the eye patch or the Wanald wolf. We never actually got them as figures, so that's kind of sad because Wanald was one of the most interesting designs that we got from the wolf's tribe. Here we have just the final layout for the wolf minifigs, and if you own any of the Chima Wolves figures, you'll probably recognize these exact headpieces. And of course, yet again, we have the final versions being used for the Chima TV series, which showcased all of the characters and their names. And lastly, we just have a very brief view for the Ravens. Not a lot of attention was given to the Ravens, to be honest. I was kind of surprised not to see that many different concepts. We only really have this one, which showcases a Raven alongside the other wolves. And then this piece of concept art here, which is a very creepy design for the eyes. I mean, look at those bloodshot eyes. That actually is pretty terrifying to get as an official Lego piece. But unfortunately, this is really all we have for the Ravens. Aside from them, we actually got a number of different animal designs, namely for the bears. Here we can see the standard Lego polar bear mold, actually from the early Arctic stuff, making a return here. Also introducing the much larger polar bear legend beast, complete with skulls hanging off the sides. That is really cool. And of course, we have the standard animal with the warriors and the shaman as well. Kind of wish we got these as a more formidable force going into the first year of Chima. The bears were a tribe that never really got a lot of attention until year three, and even then it kind of felt a little bit like too little too late. So I kind of wish that we actually got these from the outset, but I guess the bears were swapped for presumably the ravens because they needed another evil flying force to oppose the eagles on the good side. Now moving onwards, we have the fully colored in bears. It was a little bit hard to tell from the first image if they were supposed to be polar bears or regular bears, but this one actually shows they were supposed to be regular brown bears, which we can see from the right to the left, the one with the minifigure wearing the bear skin outfit, and then we have the kind of cross between the molded head and the minifig head, and then finally we have the axle-like big fig, which we saw earlier in the video, which showcases that massive bear head atop a plus-size Lego minifigure. Moving on from the bears, we move into some of the characters that we got for year two, and those are the bats. So this is just the simple bat exploration that we have that is a similar design as some of the other ones where we have different concepts being utilized from the minifig faces being used to a more pronounced ears and hair to a fully molded head which we eventually got. Interesting seeing how the different choices of wings were considered. Eventually we did get the bat wings in the middle, although we would actually get a mold for the wings that look very similar to the wings on the ones on the side for LEGO Video of all things which introduced them as dragon and unicorn wings. 
Moving onwards, we have the Vultures. So the Vultures here actually kind of look like the Phoenixes in the way that the headpiece on the right is designed. Obviously the one on the left is a really cool mold, but if they wanted to stick to the design archetypes that they set off to create for the rest of the Chima tribes, that one on the far right is closest to what we would eventually get. Moving onwards, the Vultures were again another tribe where they really were trying to delve into that particular aspect of designing the Legend Beast alongside Standard Animal. So we have a Standard Vulture which would have scaled nicely with minifigs, and then a much more massive, rideable Legend Beast Vulture in the center, complete with the regular Warriors and the Shaman as well, looking particularly regal with a very interesting looking staff. Moving on from that, we have another concept for the Polar or Ice Bears. This is probably done a lot closer to the actual Year 3 of Chima because it obviously is using the standard Chima designs. And we also have one for Rogon the Rhino, which also is probably one made very late in conceptual design, given how close it is to the final design. And here we can see the actual development of the mold processes themselves, from the standard white plastic to the custom painting, all the way up to the final Rogon the Rhino minifigure, who was actually shown off during a Convention, I believe it was some sort of a toy fair where they were showing off different future Lego products. And unfortunately there are no photos, but behind them you can actually see some more prototypes of the other Chima figures. Moving on, we have some other miscellaneous tribes. What's most interesting to me is that they actually were trying to introduce the Lego Beavers as a full-on tribe in Chima. We did technically get one of the beavers in year three, but they kind of cheated and just recolored the Yeti mold because they ran out of budget to give us a new beaver head mold. This piece here seems like it was specifically designed to actually fit with the TV show itself, and it would have been really nice to actually get that piece as a real LEGO element, especially because the beavers are still popping up in LEGO Ninjago to this day. And we did also get an actual prototype beaver figure, which you can see right here in the commercial itself, which is fascinating to me that they went as far as actually making a beaver character in minifig form, but unfortunately never went beyond that. Or are these supposed to be lions? You tell me, I mean, in the commercial, they chi up and become lions, but the commercial also was just kind of throwing around all sorts of other things. So maybe these were supposed to be lions, but they really don't look like that to me. Although, I guess the front teeth do suggest lines instead of beavers given how sharp they are. Moving on from that, we have the scorpions themselves. Here we have the scorpion legend beast, who actually, funnily enough, is brick built. Unlike the other legend beasts, which seem to be fully molded, they opted to actually decide to brick build it, which is kind of interesting. It does seem to feature some molded components, but then you have the classic Lego scorpion piece, which is pretty funny seeing alongside it, trying to mix up the different Lego styles. And I really like how they actually spent a lot of effort into developing the same exact character archetypes for each tribe, from the wizard or shaman to the animal power wielding warrior to the regular warrior up on the side there. Finally, the Dark Tribes and the New Tribes introduced for Chima Year 2 for the Outland series were introduced for this particular concept sketch here, and this is basically identical to what we eventually got, except for Rogon's armor being just a different style than what we eventually got for the final set. Scorm the Scorpion there has basically the same exact piece as we eventually got though, so pretty much almost everything else is the same here. And finally, one last animal that we got here is Plovar, and yes, we were originally planning, or at least at some point, they were planning to have a Lego Plovar actual character. Now, Plovar did appear in the show itself, although it wasn't really clear what exactly he was supposed to be, because he was an animal, but he wasn't a humanoid animal, he kind of just looked like a regular animal, albeit a little cartoonish. And he also could talk, so no one really knows what Plovar was supposed to be, but it's kind of funny because you can actually see an actual minifigure like compatible design here, where they specifically say that he's got his legs on one stud to keep the Lego touch, which is something I kind of now wish we actually got as an actual Lego build. But then we have finally summed up the minifigs themselves, and we can cover just some final designs for the first year minifigures, as well as some MacGuffins that they were trying to incorporate what are the things that these animals are fighting over. So here we have this very interesting concept artwork for what could have been the collectibles for the Chima Wave. From magical swords, to flaming artifacts, to gems, rubies, shields, and even these special animal pieces, which again we could see in many of the concept artwork which showed minifigures shooting animal heads out of their arms, there were a lot of different collectible concepts envisioned for the world of Chima, eventually deciding on the very simple Chi.
just simply collecting the little chi crystals and the one by one lego tiles to place in their chests. It was probably the most simple collectible we had ever seen from any lego theme, but to be honest, I don't think they needed anything more complex than that given the importance of chi in universe, and of course they do want to have to sell the concept of the buildable figures, so it makes sense they would eventually scrap all of these and just go for what was most simple. But moving on from that, we have a couple final sketches of the first year characters from Tommy Anderson, specifically to dictate to the TV show designers what are the characters of these creatures, what kind of personalities are they evoking here, so it's kind of cool to see these come straight from his sketchbook. Of course we have one of the beavers there as well, plus Dom de la Wush, who was once called El Rapido, but thanks to copyright issues they could not call him that, and they just changed his name to Dom de la Wush, which is what Tommy Anderson wanted to call him anyways. So all worked out. Finally, we have the Plover character being sketched here, which is basically very similar to what we saw in the show itself. But again, what was the deal with Plover? Why, why does he exist? Moving on from that, we actually move into year two. So all of those designs were just for year one. And of course we saw a few bats and spiders and scorpions, but those were actually envisioned as the year one villains. It wasn't until year two where they finally decided to actually seriously focus on one, the legend beasts, where we can see this final design for the legend beasts themselves, and of course, the insect bad guys. So this is probably one of my favorite concepts just because of the color scheme alone. You can see the black and transparent neon green color scheme being a very strong factor for the design of these characters, featuring a mosquito, a hard shell beetle, some scorpions, a praying mantis, a spider, and I kind of wish that they just stuck to just having the insects being the main villains instead of a bit of a strange mix up for the Outlands year two, where yes, we did get insect villains, but we also got the bats, which I guess they did already spend a lot of design development effort into making bats, so they wanted to include the bats somehow, but the bats always felt a little bit out of place, especially when compared to the other tribes. Now, here we can see the insectoid designs with a very unique and controlled color scheme. Now, of course, this is the same exact color scheme that we got an entire concept artwork based on, so if you're interested in that, do check out the first video we put out on this, which actually goes into this concept art sketch in detail, showing some of the vehicles these may have been using. Of course, as they finally decided on the characters, they eventually went for the bats, spiders, and scorpions, where you can see a very purple and black inspired bat here. Kind of wish that the bats had a little bit more purple in them than we actually finally got. Then we have the spider in the brown color right here, which is very close to what we eventually got. Funny how he's using a web shooting piece, which we wouldn't get for Chima, but we would get something pretty similar for Spider-Man. And then we have the red or dark red and black scorpions, which again really tie back to those older Lego Scorpion Knight designs from Knight's Kingdom 2, which I kind of wish that we got, but also at the same time, we did already get Scorpion Knights in the same color scheme, so I understand why they did something different. But then we move into year three. And these were the zombified ice animals, and this is really probably one of my favorite sketches for all of the different creatures here, because it really shows the amount of creativity they were trying to introduce for these characters. One thing I really love and wish that we got was the inclusion of specialized minifigure torsos and legs, which allowed you to attach elements with clips on them. So that way you could have fully skeletal villains, but you also could have villains who were wearing minifigure torsos, but had skeleton arms attached to the torsos, or even better, having one skeleton leg attached in a clip and one standard minifig leg. I understand why we did not get this, but then again, around the same time in 2013, we did get a minifigure leg attachment for Darth Maul from the Clone Wars, which allowed you to interface clip-on leg attachments, so they easily could have done it if they wanted to. It's just a shame that we never actually got that sort of specialized minifigure design for the sets themselves, even if the transparent limbs we got were just as cool. Now, what's interesting is that here we can see one of the early sketches of one of the zombified hunters just swallowing a piece of chi because he has nowhere to plug it in, so that's pretty funny to see here. A very vibrant sketch showing them chiing up. And then we have different iterations of the villains. So this is quite interesting because it showcases Sir Fangar in just a purely zombified state. There is no icy element shown here whatsoever, he is purely a zombie-like animal. And this was ultimately rejected by the heads at LEGO because they felt that having just plain zombies was a little bit too graphic. And so, 
they introduced a little bit of ice and they were like okay well if we can't do zombies we'll have them be reanimated ice warriors what that meant is that they basically were allowed to put as much rotting flesh and muscle as they wanted to on the characters but just add a little bit of an ice aesthetic which honestly made them even more unique so you have this one right here with a very interesting exposed rotting flesh on the side of the face which we did eventually get for some of the characters which was pretty shocking to see from lego very cool there and then we have a fully decomposed version right here with an almost fully skeletal look obviously he's using the ninjago skeleton leg piece for one so one of his boots or feet has remained but the rest of him has been fully decomposed to full skeleton and i kind of think it would have been cool to see the ice warriors slowly decompose over the course of a season and maybe get two different minifigs for the same characters showing them in different stages of decomposition Moving onwards, we have a full-on character for the Mammoth here. Really like how the Mammoth is holding a weapon with the trunk, which is something the Mammoths could actually do for Chima, so that was a nice touch. And then moving on from the Mammoth, we have the Vulture, which is very close to the final Vulture that we did get for LEGO. Though unfortunately, we never actually got those skeleton pieces being added as limbs, which is a big shame. Kind of wish we did actually get those as limb attachments. And finally, we have the Good Guys. So what's very interesting to me is that Chima Year 3 started off as just the regular animals versus zombies, and then transitioned to regular animals versus ice zombies, and then transitioned into the fire animals versus ice zombies. So this is kind of the in-between, where they were trying to recreate our heroes in a more snowy outfit, where they were not actually imbued with fire stuff, but they actually were using some icy-like powers, which we can see here, and to combat the cold weather, they're all wearing these cold capes and whatnot. This is such a cool design, and I kind of wish that we actually got these. The fire animals are pretty cool, but this also is a completely different design, unlike anything we saw for the actual actual theme, and I just love the aesthetic of all of the characters putting on different white cloaks and capes and going off into battle in a somewhat unified color scheme which you can see here with the sand blue and white being the primary color. But of course, they did want to introduce the fire versus ice eventually, and so here we have the first concepts for the fire chi. Here is just the standard Laval donning the fire chi and his sword bursting into flames, and then they had a concept where the animals could actually put on different phoenix masks, which you can see here, and channel the powers of the phoenix, which were kind of incorporated into the concept in the form of the fire wings, but not quite to this extent. Although again, it would have been a little bit odd to see a lion wearing the face of an eagle. And finally, we have the concepts for the actual fire outfits themselves. These are closest to what we eventually got for the final designs, but it is interesting seeing how they were originally supposed to be really ornate with the actual flame-like colors being imbued in the outfits themselves. I really like the heiress concept here, like she has a kind of cloth-like cape or contrails of the fiery leather right there. And then we have Fluminox, the main phoenix, who also looks incredibly regal in his design. Thankfully, we did basically get that armor piece molded in gold for the actual minifig. Here are the two different versions of Tormac slash Panthar here. This is the first one with a very regal looking design with the very nicely detailed shoulder pads, which probably would have been a little bit too detailed to make as a real Lego minifig. And finally, Panthar with all the fire burnt away for the final design. But with that, we have summed up all of the different LEGO Chima minifigure designs that have been revealed to this date. And wow, that was a lot. All right, and with that, we have summed up our look at pretty much every single piece of minifigure concept art that exists out there for LEGO Legends of Chima. There was, again, a lot to unpack in this video, so let me know down in the comments below, what do you think? Did you like some of them? Did you dislike some? Are you happy with what we got, or do you wish we got some of these other alternate designs? After all, as usual, thank you so much for tuning into Duck Bricks, and subscribe for even more LEGO news, reviews, discussion, and analyses coming your way very soon. Thanks so much, and bye-bye for now.